hello that's not helping there you go uh <laughs> chapter 14 yeah that sounds right chapter 14 of that what happened yesterday can you tell me uh, in the book they did some stuff they talked uh the oh. was naked under a blanket and they headed off to Leo 5. Yeah, and and mm -hmm. and the older lady is a um, star Startup talker. of the past. Yeah. No, present. It's present. I quite liked all that. And uh, uh, yeah, and we're discovering more and more about these interesting people. Uh, chapter 14. <clears throat> Beneath the silver arches of the Sunfire's main cabin, Mystica rummaged in a storage compartment. She pulled out some fabric, then hobbled up behind Lucky and tugged at his hair, hard. Hey, he yelled, what are you doing? Please calm yourself, she said. Have we not begun to trust one another, you and I? Now hold still, this won't hurt a bit. She began to braid his hair, plait over plait, lock over lock. I can't believe you're doing this, said Bixer in a low voice. Why not? murmured the old lady as she would. His hair is long enough. He can borrow your boots. You're about the same size. And you've got another pair, haven't you? I've still got Jonathan's old lenses, you know. He can use them. Their talk made Lucky nervous. What exactly was Mystica doing to him? And who was this Jonathan she'd mentioned? It was hard to hold still as the old lady braided his hair working it up into two great strands. It didn't hurt, but it felt tight and itchy across his scalp. It even felt more uncomfortable when she started to wrap the braids above his head in velvet fabric, twining silver thread around them, velvet and thread, just like he'd seen on Captain the captain's horns and frolics. You're making a disguise for me, aren't you? He said. You're making my hair look like horns. No, she replied, twisting the threads up tight. I'm making your hair into horns. Er, uh, he blinked. You don't mean that's what axe or horns are? Hair? Just hair, said Mystica. She nipped, snipped the threads and tied them off. It's a traditional style for men. It's not. It is a great dishonour to be seen without your horns. Women wear their hair differently. Some have it up, some have it down. And then there's Bixer, only Bixer, who has those ugly needles. I need them, protested Bixer. I couldn't defend us without them. Lucky's mind was reeling. But why would anyone shape their hair into horns? He asked, struggling to understand. Don't you know it looks like the devil? The horns point up to the stars said Mystica simply. They remind us where we all came from and where we will all return. And we're not going to change it just because some groundlings don't like it, added Bixer. Oh, he looked across at her. So where are these boots I'm supposed to borrow from you? He couldn't ma imagine boots that would fit over hooves. These boots, muttered Bixer, and she reached down and hoisted up her trousers. She touched the side of her leg and then slowly, carefully, pulled at one of the hooves. She pulled and pulled and pulled until the hoof slid off her leg, revealing a foot. A bare foot with five long, slender toes. You've got feet, gasped Lucky. Mm-hmm, said Bixer as she pulled off the other hoof and put it down by the first. He stared at her, stunned. There was a metallic sole along the bottom, the metal he'd glimpsed when, when they were doing the astral martial arts. Above the sole was an area shaped like a hoof, big enough for a foot to fit inside it. It led up to a perfectly moulded ankle, calf, knee. But then there was an opening above the knee where the whole thing ended. Boots. They were massive, skin tight, thigh high. Boots, not hooves at all. But I thought... You thought we all had hooves, didn't you? Scoffed Bixer. You groundlings, you believe anything. How could we have hands up top, but hooves down below? It doesn't even make sense. Lucky scratched his head 
at the base of his new horns. His mental picture of the axer was changing so fast he felt dizzy. Why don't more people, more humans, know about this? Perhaps it suits them not to know, Mr. Gus shrugged. People have a way of seeing what they expect to see, not what is actually there. OK, he said, trying to think his way into the situation. So let me guess, your fiery eyes are just contact lenses, right? No, said Bixer, our eyes are real. They're one big, that's the one big evolutionary difference between us. Our eyes are adapted for space travel, so they're sensitive to a wider spectrum of light. Oh, so uh, when Miss Dicker said she was going to make my eyes burn, Bixer shook her head and turned away. Never you mind, said Miss Dicker quietly. She rummaged in the compartment again and pulled out a tarnished silver box. Of course, we can't change anything inside you, Lucky, she said, opening the box and fishing out a pair of purple contact lenses. But these will make you look like one of us on the surface, and they'll expand your vision a little too. Don't worry, dear, you're not the first human who needed to pass as an axer. Lucky tried not to blink as she placed the soft lenses onto the surface of his eyes. There, said Mystica, you won't even notice them. Now they're in. Now put on Bixer's boots. He glanced at the hooves and then at Bixer. She wouldn't meet his gaze. Go on, said Mystica, don't be shy. Very reluctantly, he pulled them on, one at a time. It felt so strange. They were enormous and clumpy. He was bound to trip over his own feet in them. Are you sure about this? He said. They're a little big. Oh, yeah, snapped Bixer. Stand up and let's see what happens. He did, and to his amazement, the hooves fitted around his feet perfectly. They seemed to adjust to his shape, his posture, his movements, almost as if they were intelligent. He took a step forward, and it was like his feet suddenly had power steering. They were so well cushioned. They made him feel ten feet tall. He grinned. In boots like these, he thought, I could even climb a mountain. They're so comfortable, he marvelled, bouncing up and down. Of course they are, said Bixer. Axa technology. They adapt to their owner and to their environment to give you the best footing. Now, you've got a pair of your own. You might even stop falling over every time you walk down a corridor. She inspected him critically inside. Look, if we're really going to do this, you need one more thing. She tapped the side of a column. It opened to reveal a hidden rack of gear from which she pulled a silver coat. Long, shiny, shimmery. It was like the wings of liquid metal, just like the ones that they wore. Seriously, said Lucky, for me. Your very own space traveller's coat, she said. Like the boot boots, it adapts to the environment. Waterproof, windproof and totally fireproof, of course. Lucky ran his fingers across the sleeve. It felt cool and smooth like the surface of the astrolabe. He pulled it on and felt it billow out behind him. It's amazing. Bixer pulled out on her own coat and swirled it proudly around herself. Yeah, we're pretty good at wearing... We were wearing these when you were groundlings... Sorry. We were wearing these when you groundlings were running around naked in the trees, she snorted. Though some of you still do from time to time. Lucky was too thrilled with the coat to rise to the bait. She made him... It made him feel different. No longer the boy who'd grown up on a little moon, knowing nothing of the galaxy. He felt like a space traveller now, almost like part of a spaceship crew. Well, boy, asked Mystica, what do you say? Thank you. Your clothes are wonderful. The old lady beamed with pride. She touched the column again, turning its surface into a silver mirror. Have a look and see how wonderful, she said. Lucky stared into the mirror and saw a reflection so disturbing it stopped him dead in his tracks. He still looked like himself with all the same features but it was as if he'd been born axa instead of human. He had horns that pointed up at the sky, huge black cloven hooves and violet eyes of flame. It was the very image of aliens he'd grown up hating and fearing. The enemy staring back at him with his own face. 
Attention, everyone, came Captain Knox's voice on the comm. We are now approaching Leo 5. Strap up tight for landing. Lucky looked away from the mirror to the vid screens where Bixer was trying to get a clear image of the view outside and found himself staring at something even more disturbing. Through the cackling static, a solar system was coming into view. At its centre was a giant golden star with several planets orbiting around it. The largest was the fifth world out, Leo 5. It was golden too, its continents all dotted with points of light like miniature constellations. It seemed to be a world of plenty shining out under its sun. But further away in the far distance, green fire filled the blackness of space, completely filled it. Lucky could see nothing beyond it whatsoever. It was, all, it was as if space itself had ended a wall of fire, ended in a wall of fire. At first he thought it must be interference on the vid screens, like the static, but it seemed almost solid, a barrier beyond which he couldn't imagine passing. Maybe it's these contact lenses, he thought, making space look weird. He squinted at the vid screens from another angle, but still the green fire was there, flashing like an electric threat. What is that? he asked. Miss Dicker turned to look and adjusted her headscarf anxiously. Ah, yes. You can see it now, your government's proudest achievement, the space wall. Lucky gaped at it. He'd never been this near to the space wall, never imagined how uncanny it would really look. How am I ever going to get through that, he said under his breath. Don't you fret, said Miss Dicker. She made a final adjustment to his horns, then stepped back to inspect him again. A smile as warm as sunrise spread across her face. You're one of us now. We'll take care of you. No, we're not going to read the next chapter, although that was quite a short. I hope you enjoyed that. I enjoyed that. Who knew? Who knew? The horns. Just hair. Just hair after all. That and the hooves. Do you remember the hooves? Have disgusted Lucky since the beginning of this book. He looks at them and they, he, they make him feel sick. And it's just shoes. That's hilarious. Right. Um, just goes to show not everything is what it appears to be. Don't judge a book by its cover. Don't judge a book by its cover. All of those good adages that uh, make us better people. Um, yeah, I'll do the next chapter tomorrow. Hope you enjoyed that one. Bye-bye.